Okay, we, we have uh, 48 participants today. And so thank you for being patient with us for, uh, for five minutes. And we are so thankful to have Dr. Rajini here to address all our questions and to enlighten us. And to also, you know, her, her motto is that she says, she's always learning from, from everybody. So, and that is very um, humble of her. And, you know, and uh, Michelle, to answer your question about how long is her waiting list, uh, I read on social media and a parent was saying that she actually called up the clinic in 2019 and she's, and she's yet to actually get a response for, mm -hmm. to, to, to see Dr. Rajini. So I think I don't really have to say much about Dr. Dr. Rajini. She's a sought after doctor. And as she said, she's a mother, she's a wife, and she, you know, and she's trying really hard to uh, strike a balance with all that she does. And she's doing really well. Look at her, all glowing and all smiling. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. so, so I, think, I think, you know, we would, uh, we would start this session with, with, by letting you all see a video of Naso. And then we will get straight into our topic. Why is assessment very important? And a few house rules. You have to please mute yourself. And if you want to speak, uh, you either raise your hands or put it in the chat. And Suresh and I will definitely look at the chat and we will address your questions. For some strange reason, we don't have enough time. You can always email us and we would send your questions to Dr. Rajini and she will address it in her time, I believe. So uh, we will look at our video first before we get into the session proper. Thank you again. Thank you, Suresh. 
And uh, Suresh is our behind the scenes man today, and he also happens to be our assistant secretary. So if there is any flaws with it, you know who to, who to look for. So, <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to say that, you know, as of uh, 31st December, 2021, the number of persons registered with JKM, uh, persons with disability is um, uh, 590,418, 590,418. And out of this, Persons under masala pembelajaran or learning disability, that's where autism falls under. And the, and the number reported is 211383. It's rather alarming. And we are not sure whether all these people have had assessments before they've been placed into their, into their you know, classrooms or learning centers. So without much ado, let's hear it from Dr. Rajini. And for those of you who don't know her, her profile will be posted in the chat because if I were to read it, I think it will take the entire hour we have with her. So Dr. Rajini, it's uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you again. Uh, please unmute yourself, Dr. Rajini. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share screen. Um, sorry. Right, and um, good morning, and thank you everyone um, for coming today, and um, thank you Anne for reaching out, and um, the whole NASOM team. I, I often find that when I do talks, it makes me go back to um, read, think about things, and also maybe question my practice. And, um, you know, I, what I like about doing talks is actually the question and answer um, at the end. So I'm going to try and leave time um, so that we, we have enough time for question and answer. So um, I'm going to put an alarm behind the scenes here. So if you hear a, a sound, so please um, excuse me. It's just to remind myself to, to stop talking. Um, one thing that I want to highlight is, um, for me, when I do an assessment, um, actually, I, I rely so much on um, other people to help me out with this. Number one, the parents. Number Well, actually, no, number one, the child in my room, um, the parents, definitely, and other people who are involved. And, and yesterday was a classic example of how teamwork really works. Um, yes, my waiting lists are long, but in I, I, as I said, I work with other professionals and um, in Park City and Baby and Beyond, um, my staff always tell parents, look, the uh, waiting list is long, but we have a clinical psychologist who can also do some screening and if necessary, bring the case up to Dr. Rajini to fast track. And our clinical psychologist had picked up a, a child who presented with speech delay, and she's just two and a half, and um, you know, sort of fast tracked her to the speech therapist. So the child was seen by the clinical psychologist earlier in the week. Two days later, saw our speech therapist, and our speech therapist was really concerned that the child may have a hearing problem. Referred her to the audiologist to have a hearing test the same day, and the audiologist and the speech therapist mm -hmm. picked up that the child looked a little different, had um, signs that maybe the child may have a syndrome that's associated with a hearing problem. And so they um, spoke to me um, during lunch hour yesterday, and it looks like the child may be profoundly deaf, and that's why the child may have a hearing problem. And, and so I can fast track this child. I am going to see this child next week with all that information, because by then she would have had her her final hearing assessment, and I will see that child. And hopefully then we can plan what we need to do with the child. So why I'm describing this case to you is to show you that assessments don't just take place with one person, that everybody is involved in this. Um, and there are more than uh, one professional usually involved when we talk about assessments. So 
the talk is really going to um, hopefully highlight why we children should have assessments or who who are the children who should have assessments what do we mean by a neurodevelopmental assessment um, what should an information assessment provide what information should it give us um, not just the family but professionals as well um, who are the other professionals um, that are involved in assessments um, and what their roles are and how do assessments benefit children the most important person here their families and other people involved in caring for the child so we have a lot of research now that tell us that parental concerns must be taken seriously whenever there's a, a, a concern about a child's development or behavior um, and if parents raise these concerns professionals That's need awesome. to take it seriously yeah um, yeah, I already texted. She was like, "Oh yeah, my mom is upstairs sorry. calling." Sorry, someone's talking. All right. Um. So. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. The research tells us that we need to believe parents when parents say that there is a problem with their child, okay, and that children need um, to be taken seriously as well as parents, and that parents can actually give very accurate information about their child's development, and hence, whenever we do any assessments, this must be taken into account of. In fact, as a result of a lot of this research, a lot of screening tools now use parents as the people who uh, report on their child's behavior and development. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. So who is it that should have an assessment? So if a parent has a concern about their child, we need to take this seriously, especially if this is a long standing concern. Now a long standing concern can be something that's just weeks um months and definitely if it's uh, months definitely and of course if it's been there for years okay and even more so if more than one person or the child's difficulties are noted in more than one setting a, a very common example is when parents realize that their child have a problem they send their child to a preschool daycare nanny and that child, that other person then says, I think there's a problem with the child. So this problem is pervasive. It's in more than one setting. Very often parents come to us and they say their child is misbehaving at home. And that, but then when we speak to schools, the schools say, no, this is a model child. There are no issues. So the question arises, should we be taking this seriously? Yes, we should be taking this seriously, especially if the child is um, if the behavior of the child at home is affecting a parent child relationship okay and definitely if a child's be development or behavior is affecting their ability to function in their environment so what do we mean by that yeah what's the occupation of a, of a child it's to play it's to explore it's to try out new things and it's to engage with people objects and other things around them okay so th this is very very important so why do we need assessments because um, we need to address the concerns that parents or educators may help have about their child yeah because if if we don't address these concerns that will affect the child's long-term outcome his potential, and even create more difficulties as the child progresses through the years. And quite often we see in some situations, everything comes to a head, especially when the child enters puberty and um, uh, you know, is going through that difficult period of adolescence. And when we look back, there probably have been issues that have probably been swept under the carpet or sort of patched up to make it um, such that that you know the child is able to 
cope in inverted commas in the setting or in school etc yeah the assessment is supposed to help others around understand what the child's difficulties are and then to be able to understand why that child may behave in that certain way and help us reset our expectations for that child okay and um it is also to help to recommend interventions that will help the child and those around him to uh, ensure that that child reaches his potential. Now, I've not even talked about diagnosis. We're just talking about what assessments can do. Yes, assessments can help you come to a diagnosis, okay? And having a diagnosis helps to refine that, that um, whole process of recommending interventions and deciding what would be the right interventions for that child, um, but not necessarily all children with that same diagnosis have the same interventions. Yeah, and sometimes having a diagnosis may also help tailor the needs of that child in the community, as well as how um, we decide on what's available and what can help that child in the setting that that child is um, living in. So many parents think this is the process of assessment, that the child has a problem, you come and see the professional, he, the child is assessed, you leave with a diagnosis, and you're sent, your child is then sent for therapy. Okay, And if that has been your perception all this time, I would say that's not the right, um, that's the, not the right um, uh, thinking, all right? Because not all children come out with a diagnosis. Diagnosis may not be possible in the first instance that a child is assessed and that just doing therapy is not going to help to fix, again in inverted commas, whatever the problem is based on what the assessment shows you. Okay, and, and hopefully by the end of this session, you've, you've sort of um, had a different thought about why that assessment is necessary. So again, I go back to why do we still need this assessment? Again, why we need to address the concerns that have been raised about the child in his day to day life. Okay, we also need to know how the child engages and functions in his environment. So his environment would mean how he is at home with his family within the confines of his physical home, yeah, the brick walls, but also how he is in his community when he steps out of that brick wall into the real world, how he is with his uh, peers, for example, in the playground, how he behaves when he is not restrained or in an open environment, how he is when he is with his extended family, how he or she is when they are in a uh, daycare setting, a nanny's home, a school, etc. Okay. The developmental assessment hopefully also may highlight issues with physical health and how that relates to the child's functioning. So if I um, talked about the earlier child at the start, yeah. Um, so this child has got certain um, features that sort of alerted um, people that that child may have a syndrome and that this syndrome is often associated with a hearing impairment that needs to be addressed. Or say, for example, if a child lack, is sleeping at 4 a.m. in the morning, and the reason why the child came to see you is because the parents say the child has got issues with attention, is not talking, teachers in school are always complaining that the child cannot sit still. So then we may have to look at why that child is sleeping late and also address that sleeping issue. Yeah. The idea of the assessment is also to come up with a profile of that child's strengths and weaknesses 
with regards to their developmental skills. Now, when I talk about developmental skills, these are slightly different to learning abilities. But if your foundation in your developmental skills is uh, affected, that will affect a child's learning ability in the longer term. And when we look at developmental skills, we need to be addressing all this. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about it later. As I said, the diagnosis may not be possible immediately, but we want to be able to plan to address what difficulties there are, what parents can do if that child needs referrals for intervention or further assessments. So in my setting, um, we, you know, and this is what we train pediatricians to do, yeah, getting information from parents. And sometimes I can see parents are annoyed when I try to go right back from when they were pregnant, when mothers were pregnant, okay? Um, because we know that brain development starts from even before you know you're pregnant, actually, okay? Brain development starts from five weeks um, uh, gestation. And quite often, most women don't know until they've missed a period for two weeks. So that's when the baby's already six weeks in terms of his gestation, okay? Um, we want to know about how the mother was physically, medically, mentally, all right? We also want to know about the birth process, how that child was feeding at the start, the temperament of the child as an infant. Um, when I refer to genetics, we're asking about families and any family history of any concerns. Um, for example, uh, delays in speech, um, whether or not any of the family members were clumsy or late with their walking, etc. Um, we also want to know the environment that the child is in. Where is that child now? Where is that child being cared for now? Where has he been brought up prior to this? Yeah, who has been involved in caring for the child, and how and um, what in their interaction was. We want to know about sleep, we want to know about their nutrition, what they eat, how they eat, um, who gives them the food, we want to know about the immunizations, um, what their medical history is like, and whether there have been any dental issues. All this information is extremely important, because there have been cases of children who've been sent um, for ADHD assessments. But then actually, when we take a history, that child's not sleeping because he has uncontrolled eczema and it's been going on for years, or he's snoring and he's having what we call apnea, where a child snores and then has difficulty breathing and that disrupts their um, sleep and that has an impact on their attention. And I've had cases where after we address the medical issues, actually the and the sleep problems, that child is able to function without significant attention problems in school. Okay, we want information from other sources. And, and one of the great things about um, technology nowadays is um, parents come with videos, or I can get parents to look back on photos or um, any other information. Yeah. Um, and also we want information from other sources if possible. So getting information from teachers, from carers, from other therapists if that child has seen other therapists before. And it may be past information, not something that that child is currently involved in or currently attending. And then we go into the process of informal and formal assessments, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, we do often do a physical examination if if we are pediatricians or psychiatrists, but sometimes physical examinations can be done at a later time. And, and quite often, a lot of the physical and examination involves watching a child. For example, when I watch a child move, I will also be watching to see whether, you know, he's using both sides of his body equally, because if he's very dominant on one side, um, that may be, a, 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 especially if they're young babies, that may alert me as to the fact that that child may have had a, a stroke earlier on that had been missed or that brain development has not been uh, appropriate. Yeah. Um, and very often we want to know what the vision and the hearing of the child is like. Yeah. For visual assessments, we can sometimes 
gauge that informally by watching a child play and move around. But hearing assessments often need formal assessments by other professionals. And if I'm seeing a child who's in the preschool years, especially after, you know, during this pandemic, when children have been stuck indoors, I quite often want parents to do a formal vision assessment because we are picking up children who have visual problems. And that can also affect children, other aspects of development. So what do we mean by informal versus formal assessments? Now, we must also differentiate between screening, yeah, screening as well. So screening is something that maybe a general pediatrician or a GP um, does, where they ask parents certain questions, um, watch the child briefly, and then come to a, a, a you know, a decision about whether that child needs to be referred on. Now, for most general pediatricians and general practitioners, um, they don't have much time with each patient, so possibly ma maximum 20 minutes. And so what information they gather is not really um, adequate enough to sort of give a diagnosis or even give a, a suggestion on planning and deciding what needs to be done next. So we call these informal assessments, for, uh, sorry, informal screening. Formal screening tools are, for example, the MCHAT. The MCHAT is the um, uh, questionnaire. It's the Modified Childhood Assessment of Autism in Toddlers. And it's a questionnaire that's filled up by parents. And if any of your children have the blue or pink book, the Buku Record Kesehatan from zero to five years, the MCHAT is there at the age of 18 months parents or and nurses are meant to fill up the MCHAT to screen the child to see if the child may have um, a risk of autism. And then there are other screening tools like the ages and stages questionnaire, which is age specific, and the child behavior checklist, okay, which is filled up by parents. Um, and we sometimes give the child behavior checklist to other professionals or teachers or even carers. When we talk about assessments, they take longer, yeah? And, and I often get asked why my waiting list is, is, is long um, and why other people's waiting lists are long. And that's because it takes time to observe children in the wait, in, um, to get an idea um, and to come up with a, a, a plan, yeah? And informal assessments starts in the waiting room. I often like to see what children are doing in the waiting room. Um, I like to see as I approach the waiting room, how they respond to me as they walk in um, with their parents or their carers, what they do the minute they step in. Do they start looking around for things or do they acknowledge me when they come in? Um, you know, if I don't give them toys, what do they do? Um, you know, do they run and start uh, searching their parents' pockets and handbags for the phones or do they try to entertain themselves? And then I give them toys to play with, and sometimes I don't give them toys. I just may give them a little feather or, you know, depending on their age, a, an age appropriate object to see what they do with it. Um, so with older children, I may just give them a piece of paper and some crayons. Um, and then we have the formal assessments, which is using specific tools to sit down to assess that child's abilities. Um, and there are also specific diagnostic assessments, and I've listed some of this, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that all children must get one of these at the first visit. And quite often, we may just do a brief developmental um, assessment just to see what that child's abilities and strengths are, and also to get to know that child a little bit better, okay? What I always tell parents are assessments are not exams. Quite often, especially when they come the second time round, parents are often stressed because the first time they've seen me, we've talked about strengths and difficulties, and then they go on to you know, try and work on some of these strengths and difficulties, either on their own um, or with um, therapists. And they, they, they tell the pet therapist, oh, my daughter couldn't do the puzzles in, in Dr. Rajini's clinic. Can you train her with puzzles? And, and that's not what we want, yeah? We, what we want to see is how that child has progressed 
over time with extra help. Yeah, whether that child's picking up his skills. It's not about can they ace this specific task? Yeah, that, that's not the aim of the assessment or the reassessment or the progress yeah, uh, review. Again, it's to look at all that child's developmental or learning abilities, where they're functioning, how they actually cope. So when we do these specific tasks, it's also to see how do they cope when they are in trouble. So, you know, to me, a young child who struggles um, or is upset, if he turns around and goes to his mom and pulls his mom to come along to help him, that's great because that tells me this child knows how to ask for help, as opposed to the child who just sits there and cries and cries and starts throwing things. What worries me is not that the child cannot do the task, but actually that the child doesn't know how to ask someone close to him to help. So sometimes the assessment is also to pick up these behaviors. Yeah. And of course, you know, we look at all these different aspects. Now note that I've, I've sort of separated language and social communication. Language is what a child, um, what a child understands from words, from our gestures, from our body um, actions. And communication is how that child then communicates back to us and interacts with us, okay? Play, play is so important for children and play tells us a lot about how children see the world, whether they are imitating what we do, yeah? Play is not just puzzles, play is what do they do with dolls? What do they do with animals? What do they do with vehicles, etc. Yeah, play can also be if I give them a piece of string, what do they do with it? All right, or a piece of paper, what do they do with it? Understanding how the child is able to care for themselves and whether they're aware of dangers at an age appropriate level. Sensory issues. When I was training um, as a young pediatrician in the um, uh, mid 90s, there was a lot more information coming out about sensory processing, but pediatricians were not made aware about this. And this is where, you know, I always say to my juniors that part of your training needs to be with other professionals if you're going to be going into the area of child development. And it was through sitting with occupational therapists and um, physiotherapists that I learned about sensory processing. Yeah, and it's also by sitting with um, clinical psychologists that I understood what we mean by cognitive abilities. It's not just an IQ number. It's about the process of doing the testing and seeing how the child does the testing. So I always believe that formal assessments cannot be done without a prior history about the child, informal observations, because this will tell you whether that child can cope with a formal assessment. For example, parents come to me and say, um, I, you know, my, the teacher says that he's probably got low IQ and we need to assess him. Now, if I, I don't do IQ testing, but when I do my assessment and I can see that that child cannot sit through something for more than five or 10 minutes, sending him on to do a formal IQ assessment, um, which is a two hour assessment, is not going to work because we know that child's going to score very low. Yeah, and I may want to talk to the um, clinical psychologist and say we're worried about his um, cognitive abilities, but I'm not sure whether this child can sit through a whisk. What do you think? And the clinical psychologist will say, OK, what areas do you think we need to be assessing more? And we guide that. Yeah, maybe it's just the nonverbal skills that we need to be assessing and forget about the full IQ. Yeah, so, you know, it, it helps to know then which assessments to do. Formal assessments must also be used with other information. Yeah, um, you, there's no point pursuing um, sometimes a language assessment if we are worried that that child's hearing is affected. So just like our speech therapist saw the child yesterday and she did not, um, she did not continue with a formal assessment because she said to me, 
I was worried because when I banged a toy under the table when the child couldn't see it, he did not respond at all. Yeah. Um, having a vision assessment, etc., helps to know. Yeah. And having information from other therapists and teachers. And the most important thing is that formal assessments must be done by trained professionals with prior experience in child development. I always say this, we have a lot of quacks out there who tell parents we can do assessments, we will do this, um, uh, you know, we can do all this in one sitting. And I always worry, yeah, because if you're going to do everything in one sitting, you may not be able to see that child or understand that child. So at the end of it, what should the assessment provide? It should tell you why that child is showing the concerns that child that he came in with. Why is that child's communication delayed? Why is that child having tantrums? Yeah. Um, give you an idea of the child's strengths and difficulties. And this is important for therapists as well as for teachers, not just parents. Help us to understand the level of functioning, how they cope with tasks, where to pitch our expectations. How can parents help their children at home? And how can we use daily activities to further improve that child's abilities? Yeah. And if that child needs further investigations, blood tests, referrals to other specialists like geneticists, neurologists, if they need specific interventions, then and they need to be referred to allied health professionals. And finally, the diagnosis. Is that diagnosis going to help that child? Sometimes labeling a child immediately may not help that child. Okay. And the reality is when you go out there and you have a child who has been diagnosed with, for example, autism spectrum disorder, the minute you say to, when you walk into a preschool and you say, my child has autism spectrum disorder, and um, I would like to enroll my child, I would like to find out more about your kindergarten. 50% of the time, or maybe more, that person who is seeing your child may immediately say, I'm sorry, we don't take children with autism. But we do take children with speech delay. I don't know how many of you have come across that. Okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't diagnose a child. Don't get me wrong. Okay. In some countries, having a diagnosis actually helps a child to access services. Yeah. So, for example, if you're in Australia, having a diagnosis of even mild autism will allow your child to have services paid for under the National Health Insurance Scheme. Yeah, because the, the, the government allocates a certain budget. Um, why label a child with a diagnosis is also very important to guide intervention. Yeah, in some children, having that diagnosis then helps children access certain services and also helps parents then find resources that are related to that child's diagnosis. Can a diagnosis change? Now, when I say yes, it can, not necessarily the underlying diagnosis, but maybe additional diagnosis may be added on. Yeah. And why is, does that happen sometimes? Because a child's brain is constantly changing, especially in the first five years, but even beyond that. And some, many developmental disorders have comorbidities which don't really appear in the first instance, but actually appear later on in life, all right? And sometimes because demands of a child changes as the child um, gets older. So I'm gonna illustrate that with this case. I mean, this is a real case, we've changed the name, but Lena was a child who at 18 months, her parents were concerned that she wasn't really responding to call. Um, she lacked words. She was a bit small for her age. So her pediatrician um, felt that there were developmental concerns and referred her on to a speech therapist and an occupational therapist um, after monitoring her at around two and a half years old, had also referred her to be seen by myself. Um, so she was fast tracked a little because the speech therapist and the occupational therapist also reached out to me um, because they had seen this child and they were a little bit perplexed by this child and and i'll explain a little bit more why so this girl definitely had delayed motor skills when you compare it to her speech 
um, she had good communication skills, but socially had problems with her peers. Um, when, when I did a developmental assessment, she actually had delayed motor skills, gross and fine motor. Her self-care skills, which are like her feeding, her toileting, her dressing, were also delayed for her age. But she had age-appropriate language skills with delayed interactive social skills. And why? Because she had some difficulties with waiting, turn-taking, sharing, and um, but she played with other children. And of course, we were worried about, you know, could this be autism, but she did not fulfill the diagnostic criteria. Yeah, and this was this was conveyed to parents, you know, we had an open discussion about the fact that yes, she may have some of the traits, but I can't label put that diagnostic label now, because she doesn't fulfill all the criteria that need to be fulfilled. Yeah, but we need to monitor this. We need to monitor her interaction. We need to monitor her communication. And um, she definitely had features of a developmental coordination disorder. So I'm only giving you snapshots. Yeah, there's a lot of things that happen in between. At about four and a half years old, there were significant complaints about her attention and her behavior. Yeah, she had tried more than one play school had had to leave play schools because teachers were expressing concerns. Um, she had stopped OT for a while, had to be referred back because her motor skills and some of her sensory issues um, had re-emerged. Um, the feedback from her current school was all negative. Everything was bad about her. Um, and she was refusing to participate in class activities, academic activities. When I mean academic activities, I mean thing, things like literacy, numeracy, and um, uh, you know, writing, etc. And after six months, her parents decided, okay, we're going back to a play school type environment where it didn't involve so much academic learning. And the play school was very good. They came back and said, hey, we're still concerned, and she had been to this play school before, we're still concerned about her attention. She definitely has issues with her social communication. She talks a lot, but she doesn't know how to keep to a conversation. She asks the same questions, plays with her friends, but doesn't really get rules of games, which children should be getting. She's very impulsive and very poor with her organizational skills. And then at six years old, she started in, so what did we suspect then? We suspected ADHD, of course, and she had social communication difficulties. At six years old, she started in a local government school, but because of complaints from teachers, disruptive behavior, etc. After two months, they moved her to a smaller international school. She settled in well, um, but very forgetful with her things, needed a lot of help with getting herself ready and organizing herself. So same issues. Again, issues with friendships, but she was happy. She feels that her, she, she said she had best friends and lots of good friends, but the, the feedback from teachers and also what mom was hearing was that her friends found her annoying. And then at the end of year two, things came to a head. She started to understand that children were isolating her. She had difficulties communicating with her peers. She started to have anxiety symptoms and repetitive behaviors. She had flapping before three years, but it disappeared by the time she saw me. But these were new repetitive behaviors and she was aware she couldn't control them. And she was aware they appeared when she felt nervous and she was starting to lag behind academically. And school said, we need, we need some help here. We need a formal assessment about her learning. And so I did a, a, a CARS again, and yes, um, she fulfilled the diagnostic criteria for autism, but we had always had this discussion along the way and her parents were doing things to try and help her. Yeah, so this was to illustrate to you how we needed assessments at different points, like when we did the diagnosis for ADHD that was with a questionnaire sent to school. Yeah. And so this is where you need the help of other professionals. Along the way with Lena, I needed input from her OT, from her speech therapist, who is still working with her 
on her social communication and how she interacts. Yeah, they're doing something called social thinking together with a, a little small group. And over the pandemic, it went online. And so she's still continuing to have support. So who are the other professionals? Audiologists, um, optometrists, orthoptists, yeah. Remember the audiologists do hearing assessments and not ENT surgeons. Optometrists are not doctors, they're not ophthalmologists, but they are the ones who screen initially before the child sees the ophthalmologist. See, so most doctors need the help of other professionals. And then there are orthoptists, very rare in Malaysia, but they look at how eyes move, how eyes work together. And especially if your child has squints, you may be asked to send your child to see an orthoptist. Clinical psychologists also do developmental um, assessments. They, they are better at learning assessments than us, uh, pediatricians and psychiatrists. They also do specific diagnostic assessments for autism, ADHD, mental health assessments. And then there are occupational therapists who will assess a child's needs further, especially with regards to sensory, sensory processing and functional abilities, speech language therapists, physiotherapists, and teachers. So I lump teachers in, in this group of teachers, they may be preschool, primary school, secondary school teachers, they may be uh, behavioral therapists, they may be um, interventionists, early interventionists. So these are people who work with children more on a day to day basis as well. Yeah, and they're the best people to tell you about how they interact with peers, what their behavior and attention is like, because they see them in a group setting. So what happens after the assessment? Hopefully you come out of the assessment and you understand what the, your child's abilities and difficulties are and, it, and, and how their abilities and difficulties influence their behavior, influence how they interact with their environment and what you should do about it. For example, yesterday as well, I had a, a boy with autism who's under my follow up. And so he came in and one of the um, complaints were that, you know, he likes to play with light switches. But the father was very astute and the father said, you know, I, I know why he plays with light switches. And the father wasn't upset by it when he was in my room and he was playing with the light switches. And so I said to the father, oh, he's playing with shadows. And the father says, yes. And so, you know, I said, well, then we need to feed back to school. that the reason why he's playing with light switches is because he's exploring shadows. And actually that's a positive thing because prior to this, in my room, he had never noticed his shadows. He had played with light switches and he was running up and down and switching on and off the light. But this time he would switch off the light and he would stand and he would look. And at one point when even my computer went to sleep mode, he suddenly realized and he looked because it had cast a different shadow, yeah? So then we can feed back to school and say, look, maybe if he starts playing with light switches, it's because he wants to play with shadows. Maybe we can give him a few minutes to play with his shadow, acknowledge that he's playing with the shadow, play shadows with him, and then direct him back to his task. Yeah. And how else can parents help their children? Yeah. And parents need to know why they're coming for an assessment. Yeah, I always ask parents, you know, why, why have you been sent to see me? Um, why me? Okay. And what do you, you know, um, if you have seen someone else, how different is it going to be if you see me? Parents need to understand that. Yeah. Parents need to understand why they need to take their children for further in, in assessments and investigations. And more importantly, where can I go for help? or get more information about my child to help my child. And remember that this assessment is actually where the journey begins. It's the start of things. Of course, the next step is going to be challenging because there may be so many options. But of course, some of these options, you may be limited by finances, um, logistics, distance, etc. But remember, if you have that assessment at hand, 
then this becomes easier. And what's important to understand is no one in social media knows about your child better than you and that you understand your child better through this assessment and not because someone in social media says oh you should see this person because he's the best or you should go to this place because it's the best okay so use the information that you have to decide on the path that you're going to take Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now. And open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Rajini. Always, always a lot of things to you know, learn from you. And I really like from what I got from this session, a lot of things. But I like how you emphasize on the power of observation and how the entire team must play a part so that we can get them you know, the, the best out of the child and um, assessments and the follow-up therapy can just fall into place if it's worked in a multidisciplinary. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question. Um, a question, just, okay, the question is, Sorry about this. Uh, Suresh, can you help me, Suresh? I can't seem to find the question. Unmute yourself, Suresh, please. Yeah, so um, maybe I can just uh, read out. So I think you got a few questions directly to you as well, right? Oh, is it? Okay, let me just check the chat. No, uh, to Anne, I think. Oh, okay, okay. I, I see one here, Mr. Suresh. Yeah, one question maybe I could just read out from here is uh, from uh, Hing Peng. Um, said the one time, uh, uh, I think it's, is one time assessment good enough or does it have to be done regularly? Uh, how often? Yeah, so, you know, it, it always depends on um, the child, the age of the child and what information was garnered from the first assessment. For me, um, I, I see much younger children, yeah? And with very young children, things change very quickly sometimes. When I say very quickly, I don't mean very quickly as in day to day. So very often after the first visit, um, I may not have been able to, to do a proper assessment or I may, I may have only been able to do informal assessment and maybe just a brief developmental assessment. So. I would say to the parents, look, based on what I have, this is what your child's difficulties are. But I, and I'm gonna do you a referral letter for you to see the therapist and explain to the therapist why I'm sending you. And, but I want you to come back after two or three months because I wanna see what happens after you've made changes at home, because that's often what we talk about as well, what you can do at home um and then we can take it further from there yeah for older children sometimes having someone to relook at your child um after a year may be sufficient maybe after that child's been to school for a year and we take into account what's happened because you know if you see a child one month after he goes to school well even my own children took a month to settle into school or even longer yeah, so it, it's really going to be important. But I think if your child has different needs, periodically that child should be assessed. I mean, it's like school. Schools have assessments to see how children are progressing. Yeah, and based on that, you make decisions on what you're going to do to help your child. Okay, so it's the same sort of way in a way. I hope that answers your question. So how often will depend on how comfortable you are. So in some situations, therapists provide those assessments. And so you don't need to go back to the initial doctor or the initial psychologist, but you may want to go back to that doctor or psychologist, say after years or after a period of time, depending on the age of the child. Thank you. Um, just for the information of those on this call, 
Um, Nasom has recently received a grant from the, from the Slango State Government, and that grant has been channeled towards assessment of children. And if you are in the B40 group, or you've been affected by the pandemic, you can always contact us because it has been you know, subsidized and you would only need to pay 375 ringgit for the assessment. And we do believe in continuity. So we don't just you know, stop there. We have actually collaborated with We Rock the Spectrum and they do offer play therapy for kids. So it all, you know, it would all really depend on the assessment and what are the suggested uh, therapy that you, know, you can actually do with your child. And um, it is also subsidized. So if you need more information, you can always uh, write to us in Nasom and we will be very happy to you know, give you more information. And then also, uh, you know, we know we cannot do this alone. So we have uh, different, uh, different partners actually working alongside with us. And this, this particular Zoom today is uh, hosted by the Rotary Daga Group, who is our partner in training. And then also um, uh, FWD Takafu, who has been uh, helping us to actually sponsor our teacher training. And they've also got a very good medical care for those of you who, who you know, who, who, who wants to know more about what services, you know, uh, children on the spectrum can actually receive. And um, they will be coming up with a medical card soon, which we will definitely get in touch with all of you for another talk with them as to how this can benefit uh, children on the spectrum and also adults on the spectrum. So we have been uh, you know, working alongside with these people for the betterment of children on the spectrum and also children of different disabilities. So if you really want to find out more about that, please do uh, you know, write to us. And then we've also had a parents focus group. And I think um, Intan, who was on the call, uh, she's here right now. And, you know, and she has um, offered her expertise on parental training, which we feel is so important. And so we will definitely be you know, working with Intan on that. And also uh, Sien, who is from SEEDS, who's also you know, reached out. And we will also be you know, seeing how best we can actually work alongside with everyone who wants to you know, work with us. We are a national organization. And so therefore we need to be working with all of you and uh, you know your suggestions and your cooperation with us will definitely reach out and we can uh, definitely work alongside the families and the children so that you know no one is left out okay thank you for that and uh, i know we had so much to actually take in so we would really like you to watch two videos it's not long it's less than three minutes so that you have an, a better understanding of our partners who have made this possible, because otherwise we would not be here today. So please bear with us uh, before we take your next questions. Okay, thank you for that. Could we have the video please?
that young boy who was cycling, Uzair is his name, and he has helped us to raise uh, 90 over 1,000 ringgit towards our teacher training. So we really feel that, you know, that's a very important part for our teachers to be equipped and to learn how to work with the different professionals so that we can serve you know, children and, and trust it to our centers better. So we will take the next question. Uh, or if you have a question, you can just raise your hands and you can just direct it to Dr. Rajini. Ma'am, no maybe I can read some questions that were sent, uh, I think sent to you directly. I'll read the ones they sent to me directly. So I just read it out. Please do. Uh, two questions from one person. The first question is, since the world is evolving so much into the use of technology, I would like to hear from Dr. Rajini, what kind of ways can technology or AI artificial intelligence help with assessment or how she foresee assessment becoming very advanced? That's the first question. Second question from the same person, how can we help those who are financially poor and cannot afford to do an assessment? Yeah, um, how can technology help? And I think one thing is for clear, uh, one thing that's clear is that there are certain assessments that have moved online, yeah? yeah. Um, for example, questionnaires can be done online. Um, there are certain um, visual assessments, uh, visually based assessments that can be done online. But that takes away the observation of seeing that child in your room and, and takes away all the other informal observations. Yeah, that just gives you a snapshot. And I think um, what sometimes is better is actually visual actually visualizing or being able to have another view of the child actually doing the assessment yeah so we're on the zoom call now and i showed you your slides and of course a child can be given you know something like the ravens matrices and and this is what they use when they 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 do do some cognitive assessments where the child just answers by clicking a button but what you're not seeing is behind the scenes, um, because you're not going to see that child unless you have another angle of observing that child when he was doing that assessment, what was his behaviors like? Okay, and I think around the world, everybody under, everybody knows that, yes, um, assessments can be done online. What actually helps is having videos of children playing, and there have now been um, trainings developed so we train people remotely to do uh, quick behavioral assessments, okay? Um, and this has been pioneered in many countries, especially in India, in South America, and it may be something that we wanna look towards, where we train someone locally to carry out certain um, assessments, um, they, but they, it, it's a train the trainer program. And I think that's going to be moving forward. And the WHO is funding a lot of these um, right now. In, and following on from that, how do we use those assessments to help parents understand that this is how we then intervene? Yeah. Um, I forgot the second part of the question. Um, oh, helping people from under financially. Yeah. 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 And this is where we need you know, um, funding. And then I think this is where places like, you know, people like Rotary, um, the Slango State Government, um, many others are now following suit, where they are trying to fund assessments for the B40 community. Um, and I say this to uh, a lot of, you know, my juniors, sometimes, um, it doesn't take a lot to do an informal assessment and informal assessments can give parents um, information that they know what to do next. Yeah, so it's better to have an informal assessment than no assessment at all, if you know what I mean. Okay, and on the part of, um, you know, pediatricians, we are trying to train more pediatricians to take on the role of doing informal assessments because having an assessment is better than having no assessment and at least it's a start for parents then to take action as opposed to in the past where pediatricians felt very uh, ill-equipped and the first thing they'll do is say i'm going to refer you and and then that's it i can wash my hands off you right now yeah and it's not because they don't want to help 
but because they themselves feel scared, am I going to give the right information? Yeah. And you want to ask what you have received directly, maybe? I've got a few, but maybe you can ask as well. Yeah, I just make a comment. I just want to talk about uh, parents and um, informal assessments. So when I had a conversation with Sien uh, from SEEDS, I believe she's on this call, and she did say that, you know, one of the things that they want to really focus on or work with us is about how do we train parents to do that informal assessments and how valuable that piece of information can help the teachers or the entire team, you know, working with that. And now uh, we have another question. What do we do? Or how do we tackle parents who are in denial? How do we do that in a, you know, so that very, very pressing questions because a lot of preschools that we actually work with and the teachers can, you know, observe red flags. But when they tell the parents, it, it becomes a, a very sensitive thing. So how do we do that? Um, the traditional way is to be punitive and to say to the parent, um, if you don't do something, um, we can't have your child here any, anymore, right? <laughs> that used to be how um, things used to be done. And this comes from education. I think, you know, I, I strongly believe, and I'm also part of the Positive Parenting Group, which is a, um, uh, a branch of the Malaysian Pediatric Association, where we try to educate parents on you know, being aware about their child's development, behavior, etc. And I think, you know, and it should probably come in the antenatal period or probably even before, it should come as part of probably school curriculums, you know, the start of parenting, because, you know, all of us want our children to be happy, to do well, to achieve their potential. So when parents are in denial, we have to ask the question, why are they in denial? Very often they are in denial because um, they're scared. Yeah, many of them are actually not in denial. Deep down, they probably know there are some issues, but they're scared if they um, if they acknowledge it that you know their child will be sidelined. And sometimes that that may be it. Okay. Number two is parents don't have the information about what normal child development is, or they don't understand that actually. They are so important in those early days, weeks, months in influencing their child's development and behavior. Yeah. Um, very often I, I hear things like, um, you know, when we talk about how to play with their kids, etc. Um, there are grandparents who say to me, but I never, I never play with my child and she's okay. What? So why is he like that? You know, that's a classic thing that I say to that I hear from grandparents and then I asked the grandparents did you actually look after your children when they were infants and when they were toddlers and then you realize oh they too were working and they were outsourcing the the child to another carer okay um, or actually indirectly they were interacting with their child because in those days there wasn't so much tv and um, you know um, technology available to put in front of your child yeah so you were sort of forced to 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 interact with your child. So, you know, I think sometimes it's the lack of awareness. And I strongly believe that we need to be educating parents about how they nurture their children. And, and I love this new um, thing that's been launched by the WHO, you know, about the nurturing care concept. And that applies to just general child development. How do we achieve the maximum potential in our children? Yeah, it starts from from when you they even before you think about having children, making sure you have the right nutrition before you get pregnant, making sure your mental health is um, OK before you have children, looking after yourself during that pregnancy and after your baby is born. Yeah, it's about looking after yourself, not just looking after your children. But yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajini. Self-care, self-help, as they say. So. Yes, yes. So don't so, look uh, negatively. Don't look negatively at parents who are in denial. I often get sent parents um, from therapists. Can you see this parent because they're in denial and somehow or other you can get through to them. Yeah. Or I get told that you need to, to sort these parents out or tell them off or something like that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, sometimes it's about exploring why. And I often find that actually um, didn't parents in Dan need more help than the parents who actually go look for things? 
Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think that's uh, another topic which we can explore. You know, how do we deal with with parents who are, who are not as informed? Yeah, and I would. I don't think I'd like to use the word denial anymore yes. because if you don't, yeah. So we will definitely change that that word, and you know, and we will definitely consult you again on this, Doctor Doctor <laughs> um, if We have another four more minutes, so if you have any more questions, uh, it's your chance now because otherwise you need to wait like three years to consult with Doctor Doctor Rajini. So this is your chance, and uh, while you think about it, if you can have your cameras on for those who are comfortable. We would love to take a photo. We would really love to, you know, document our session today. And we want to thank our sponsors, Rotary Daga and FWD Takafo. This is not a marketing tool, but it's just that we want to appreciate people who have worked with us to actually make this possible. And for friends and for colleagues who are here, if you have any suggestions, if you think Nasum is not doing as much as, as it should be, we really welcome your suggestions and we also welcome you to come and work with us so that together we can go to greater heights. And it's photo time now, so please uh, switch on your camera, your best smile if you want to. Uh, and we and Suresh, as soon as you're ready, the queue will, will be yeah. ready for you. It's all, all the cameras are on, switched on, please. Okay. Just a few minutes with your best smile. And to all our Nassim teachers, thank you for being here. I see teacher Jingwen and teacher Rages there from Taloklai. Thank you. A few more cameras. One stop center, okay. one little there, okay. So I'm going to take the photo now. Please switch on. Okay. Give your best smile, please. How long more? <laughs> so, wait, are we on? One more. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so, since we, we don't have any more questions, so I would like to. Questions, actually, if you like. Okay, we have. Okay, we'll question. Dr. Dr. Ginny, would you like to say something? No, no. There's this one question that I um, I, I want to address. I think it was um, put up by Hingping again. How do you know if the assessment is accurate? And um, I'm going to address it together with, with professionals, should the parent recommend to see on the first assessment? Um, the important thing is finding a trained professional, okay? And how do you know that person is trained? We now have got directories um, for uh, people who are bona fide, you know, who, who are allied health professionals. Okay. Um, for example, there's a list of um, speech therapists. There is also registered psychologists. Um, you know where to find developmental pediatricians and child psychiatrists. So there are registers now, and there is an act binding the, um, professionals. And I think what's important is that you do your homework to find out if these people are true. If you come out of an assessment and all you get are supplements, um, a brush to brush your child and uh, change your diet, you're not seeing the right professional, okay? because that's not what an assessment should do when we're talking about um, addressing needs, okay? Um, so I, I say that because we know that there are some professionals doing that out there. You should come out of an assessment knowing what your child's strengths and difficulties are, what you can do at home to change things. Yeah, it may be adjusting your child's diet, um, but with good evidence for that. Okay. Um, and who should the child see? I often believe it should be someone who is aware of child development, depending on the problem. Yeah, if it's a behavioral or mental health issue, a child with anxiety or OCD symptoms, maybe it needs to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist first, not a pediatrician. 
So it really depends on what the issue is. Um, how long, so, so you will know if the assessment is accurate if you come out of the assessment getting the information that I said to you. Yeah, you may not have a, a printout or a number or something like that, but you should know how to help your child, what your strengths, child's strengths and difficulties are. Then you know your child's had a developmental assessment. How long a session should be is going to depend on how the child is, because some children within half an hour, they're screaming and crying and they have to leave the room. But then that child should maybe be seen again or the parents should be seen without the child if it's too stressful for the child. So it really depends on, on that. Yeah. So and I always say to parents, when you're going for intervention, don't expect any changes in the first three months. If you see changes, bonus. What you want to see is over a period of time. So I have parents who go and say, oh, I've been for eight sessions. I don't see any difference. Yeah. But then they come into my session and they, they see, actually, there have been some changes. Um, so I think it's about gauging that and understanding what the goals are of intervention as well. OK. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajini. And if you want to find out about our early intervention program or our intensive uh, therapies, Muzamil, our, our center coordinator in uh, First Light in Satya Alam, he's actually put his, his comments there. And I know we have gone uh, a little bit over time, 10 minutes over time. So we would like to um, end here. And for those of you who have just posed your questions, we apologize, we won't be able to take it at this point but we will forward it to Dr. Rajini. And uh, we really appreciate all of you coming. And of course, Dr. Rajini, once again, on behalf of NASO, thank you so much for doing this talk for us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a privilege. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.